Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 39. In this lecture, we'll discuss moment of inertia. This topic is covered in Chapter 10 of our textbook by Sir Wei and Jouette. So we've been talking about a rotational or angular motion. As it turns out, it takes a certain amount of force to rotate an object. We would like to quantify that statement. We'd like to be able to calculate exactly how much force it takes to rotate a certain object. To make this idea more precise, consider the scenario shown here. On the left, I have a rod with two spheres attached to its end. On the right, I have exactly the same rod and exactly the same two spheres, except now the spheres are attached to the rod a little bit closer to the center of the rod. Rather than attaching the spheres at its end, I've moved them in, I've attached them closer to the center of the rod. And the question is, which one of these is harder to rotate? So imagine grabbing each object in the middle at the center of the rod, and imagine trying to rotate it. Imagine trying to twirl it around as you would do with a baton. As it turns out, the object on the left is going to be more difficult or harder to rotate. To understand that idea and to quantify it precisely, what we need is the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of an object measures the object's resistance to angular acceleration. So an object with a large moment of inertia, like the object on the left, would be difficult to rotate because it resists acceleration. Whereas an object with a smaller moment of inertia, like the one on the right, would be easier to rotate because it doesn't resist acceleration as much. To precisely calculate the moment of inertia of a collection of particles, we use this formula here. m sub n is the mass of the nth particle. For these objects, we might have only two masses the sphere on the left and the sphere on the right, but in general you can have as many masses as you want. You take the mass of each one, the first one, the second one, the nth one, and you multiply it by r squared. r here is the distance of the nth particle from the axis of rotation. The perpendicular symbol here says that you must calculate the shortest distance or the perpendicular distance from the nth particle to wherever the axis of rotation is. If you're grabbing this object in the middle and rotating it around the center, then the axis of rotation would pass through the center of the object. But you can also grab the object maybe at one end and rotate it around that point, in which case the axis of rotation passes through that point. In any case, r sub n perpendicular is the distance of each particle to the axis of rotation. In general, the larger i is, the more difficult the object will be to angularly accelerate. Calculating the moment of inertia of an object is extremely important for analyzing the angular motion of that object. Calculating the moment of inertia is also a tricky calculation, so we're going to do a series of practice problems to make sure that you are comfortable with moment of inertia. In each figure below, x indicates the axis of rotation. Assume the rod is massless and each sphere is a point particle of mass 1 kilogram. Calculate the moment of inertia in each case. So we're going to consider five different cases or five different scenarios. In each case, we have a rod that is relatively light. We can say that its mass is negligible. And then we have two relatively heavy spheres, each one with a mass of one kilogram. The total mass of the object is the same in all five scenarios. What's really different is the distribution of the mass relative to the axis of rotation. Notice that we have different axes of rotation. In scenario A, we're imagining that we're grabbing this object in the middle and rotating the whole thing around that central point. It doesn't really matter whether you're rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, the moment of inertia is insensitive to that fact. In scenario B, we're doing exactly the same thing, again, rotating the object relative to the center of the rod, but this time the spheres are further in. The object in scenario C is exactly the same object as scenario A, 
but the axis of rotation is different. So this time we're not grabbing the object in the middle, we'll, we're grabbing it a little bit closer to the right end and rotating around this point. In scenario D, we're grabbing the object at its left point and rotating it around that point. And in scenario E, we have something that resembles a hammer. So we're grabbing the object on the right side and the heavy side of the system is on the left the entire system is rotating around the right end of the rod. Think about this for a few seconds and see what your intuition tells you. Which of these cases do you think is easiest and which is hardest to rotate? To answer that question precisely, of course, you need to do the calculations. The calculations are essentially the same in every case. The formula that you will want to use is the formula that we saw just a minute ago. In this case, we really only have two masses, so we'll want to take the mass of object one multiplied by the distance of object one squared plus mass of object two times the distance of object two squared. To be a little more precise, these distances are the perpendicular distances to the axis of rotation, so they are not the coordinates of the masses, Instead, they are the distance of each mass to where the x is located to the axis of rotation. Using this formula for object A, I find that its moment of inertia is 0.5 kilograms meter squared. For object B, it is 0.08. For object C, it is 0.58. Object D is 0.05, and object E is 1.45 kilogram meters squared. Based on these numbers, we can see that scenario D is the easiest to rotate, whereas scenario E is actually the most difficult to rotate. It has the largest moment of inertia. Let's do another practice problem involving moment of inertia, this time for a more interesting object. Three-point particles, each with mass m, are attached to the corners of a lightweight equilateral triangle with sides of length l. Calculate the moment of inertia about the axis of rotation as shown. So we have a triangle consisting of three rods. The three rods are massless. Their masses are negligible. But we also have three spheres attached to the corners of this equilateral triangle. And these each have mass m. The spheres are separated from each other by length L. We want to calculate the moment of inertia. Our final answer will be in terms of M and L. Notice that the axis of rotation is running vertically. It's important to know where the axis of rotation is and how it's ro uh, oriented because in calculating the moment of inertia, we need to know what the distance of each particle is relative to the axis of rotation. The calculation can be done as follows, so we're using the same usual formula. For object 1, the mass is m. Its distance to the axis of rotation is 0. So I'm referring to this sphere as object 1. As you can see, this sphere is sitting on the axis of rotation, so its distance to the axis of rotation is 0. Object 2, this one, is a distance l over 2 from the axis of rotation. So we know that the entire length of this rod is L and therefore the distance from this object to the axis of rotation must be half of that, which is L over 2. Notice that we are calculating the perpendicular distance. So the distance uh, must be the shortest distance to the axis of rotation or the perpendicular distance. That's the meaning of this symbol over here in the formula. We take all L over 2, don't forget to square it, and then we turn to object 3, which is exactly the same distance from the axis of rotation. So the distance of object 3 from the axis of rotation is L over 2 as well. We square it, we put everything together, and we find that for this particular triangle, rotating around this particular axis, the moment of inertia is 1 half ML squared. If m and l were given to us as numerical values, we could now substitute those in. Let's do another practice problem with the moment of inertia. Three identical spheres, each with mass m, are attached to the corners of a lightweight equilateral triangle with sides of length l. 
calculate the moment of inertia about the axis of rotation as shown. Notice that this object is exactly the same object that we described in the previous problem. What's different here is the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is no longer a vertical line. The axis of rotation is a line that goes into the page perpendicular to the screen or plane of the page. And we're now imagining that these three points are rotating around that axis of rotation. We now need to know what the distance of each one of these points is to this point here to the axis of rotation. To figure out that distance, we need to do a little bit of geometry. Here's an equilateral triangle. Let's bisect each angle. So we have drawn these dashed lines that bisect or divide these vertex angles into two. It's an equilateral triangle, so each angle is 60 degrees. If we've bisected this angle, this angle here is 30 and this angle here is 30. This bisector forms a 90 degree angle with the opposite edge, similarly for the other bisectors. The distance that we're interested in, in calculating the moment of inertia, is this distance here. So the distance from the corner to the center of the equilateral triangle, which is where the axis of rotation is passing. So we're interested in calculating R perpendicular. The length of this triangle, the length of each side is L, so this distance here is L over two. With a little bit of trigonometry, we know that the cosine of this angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, so we can say cosine of 30 is L over two divided by R perpendicular. Rearranging this equation, we find that R perpendicular is simply L over rad three. Recall that cosine of 30 degrees is rad 3 over 2. Now that we know the perpendicular distance of this particle to the axis of rotation, we can calculate the moment of inertia. Um, this is an equilateral triangle, and so the distance of each particle is exactly the same to the axis of rotation. We don't need to repeat the calculation. We find that when we take the mass and multiply it by distance squared, and we do so for each mass, putting everything together, the moment of inertia of this object for this particular axis of rotation comes out to be ML squared. So far, we've been calculating the moments of inertia for relatively simple, discrete bodies, bodies that consist of two, three, or a handful of point particles. But what about continuous bodies? What about objects with a continuous mass distribution? For such objects, we have to integrate. The formula isn't really that different. You still have to calculate the distance to the axis of rotation. You square it and you multiply it by the mass. This is the mass of an element or infinitesimal piece of the object. That mass is going to be equal to density times the volume of that element. This integral is somewhat difficult to perform because the volume element requires that you multiply the length times the width times the height. If you're looking at an infinitesimally small bit of the volume, then the length and the width and the height are essentially dx, dy, dz. So this integral is really a triple integral involving three integrals in the three dimensions of space. This is the type of integral that you learn how to do in multivariable calculus. For our class, I will not expect you to be able to do this kind of an integral. Instead, I expect you to be able to use this table. This table appears in your book and it lists the moments of inertia for various important shapes. So the formulas here have already been calculated for you using this equation on the left. The shapes listed here are extremely important because they can be used to make up more complicated shapes. For example, if you want to calculate the moment of inertia of an airplane, you might say, well, the fuselage of an airplane can be modeled as a cylinder, and the wings of the airplane might be modeled as rectangular plates. So to calculate the moment of inertia of an airplane, I'll just add the moment of inertia of a cylinder to the moments of inertia of two plates, let's say. Notice um, that some of the shapes listed in this figure 
um, are different in subtle ways. For example, here we have a sphere, and on the right we have a sphere, but the sphere on the left is a solid sphere, whereas the one on the right is a hollow sphere. It's referred to as a spherical shell. Obviously, the mass is different in a solid, is distributed differently in a solid sphere than it is in a hollow sphere. Also notice that the axis of rotation is important. We have a rod on the left and we have an identical rod on the right, but here we're rotating the rod around its center, whereas here we're rotating the rod around one end. So the distribution of mass matters, but the axis of rotation matters as well. Make sure you can find this table in your book and make sure you can refer to it as needed. As we just explained, if you want to calculate the moment of inertia of a complicated shape, you could break it down into simpler shapes. It turns out that the moment of inertia of a composite system is the sum of inertias of the individual components. So once you've taken a complicated shape and broke it down into simpler shapes, you can calculate the moment of inertia of each simple shape and then add those together. As an example, consider this object here. This object consists of a sphere that has been glued or welded to a cylinder. By looking at the table in your book, you can figure out that for a cylinder rotating about its axis, the moment of inertia is one half mr squared. For a sphere rotating about an axis that passes through its center, the moment of inertia is two fifth mr squared. So if you wanted to take this entire object and rotate it, the moment of inertia of the entire object would be given by this sum here. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.